Welcome to Western Connecticut State University. My name is Missy Alexander. I'm the provost here today, and I'm so thrilled to have you join us for this exciting lecture uh, on a very topical uh, subject in terms of cybersecurity and uh, Facebook and social media and all. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, let those of you who are not part of our university community know that actually at this university we have degrees in cybersecurity and computer science and digital media, all related to the topics this evening. So if you are interested in following up, you should check out those programs. But most of all, what I wanted to uh, say this evening is thank you to the Macrocostas Family Foundation. This is one of two important lectures that we have every year that is a result of the generous donation that they have given to the university. They have also funded numerous scholarships and other events on the, on, at, at Western. But this is the Macrocostas Speaker Series, and you were handed out a little brochure, I hope, which tells you about the discussion that we'll have in the spring about, that will center on Hellenic studies. The Macrocostas donation is part of the name of the School of the Macrocostas School of Arts and Sciences, where he has committed to making sure that we continue to have these enriching dialogues as public events. So uh, just you know, at this moment, I wanted to say thank you to them for all of the work that they've done and the generosity to the university. And the last thing that I will say before I introduce uh, the dean of the Macrocosta School is to say, this building is hopping. We're happy to have you here for this lecture, but there is a bunch of music and art and performances going on from here to the end of the semester. Come back, they're amazing. The students are doing amazing work. So I hope you follow us and pay attention to the many events that are going on in the Visual and Performing Arts building. But now I'd like to welcome Dean Michelle Brown of the School of Macrocostas Arts and Sciences, sorry, I got lost in the middle of that sentence there, and she will introduce our speaker this evening. Good evening, it is my especial pleasure to introduce Chris Kelly tonight uh, for the Macrocostas Speaker Series. Uh, as the Dean of um, the Macrocostas School of Arts and Sciences, uh, it is it's such an honor to, uh, to be a part of this enterprise, to be a part of this school, and to, to be able to bring this to you. Uh, Mr. Kelly is an expert in data security and privacy and the ways that these issues impact all of us in various ways in our daily lives. And so since you're not here to see me, you're here to see him, I, it's my pleasure to bring him out. And I hope you'll give him a wide round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm Chris Kelly. I uh, am a lawyer by training, um, but have worked in the field of privacy, safety, and security uh, for about 20 years now. And uh, you know, was the honored to be the first general counsel at Facebook and chief privacy officer. And so have continued to you know, have an overview about what privacy, safety, and security can mean in our ongoing social media world. Um, so I want to run through a number of different things tonight, and I'm going to I'm going to wander a little bit. Um, it's fun to uh, it's fun to wander. Um, I first want to offer some framing thoughts um, about how we should think about these issues, um, the, the 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 challenges that are poised by the changes to our world. That, as I often say, the you know the supercomputer that you hold in your hand, talking to supercomputers in the cloud what that means for um, all sorts of different types of human relations. The way that uh, we think about how we communicate, we connect with our families, with our friends, um, and how we see time, how we see the way that, that the back and forth happens um, and, and how people are communicating. Um, I want to run through what I call five fun stories. And they're not all fun, <laughs> by the way. There's, there's plenty of challenges to them. And then I want to offer some, some thoughts at the end. And I'm, going to off, and I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions, because I think that that's where we get a lot of interactivity and learning from each other is, is where we ultimately kind of come back to our human point. 
Um, technology can be really great. And out in Silicon Valley, we talk about um, you know, bots and everything talking to each other at incredible speed. And there's, there's this, this obsession with the back and forth and, and how fast does it go. And in a lot of contexts, we need to think about how we slow things down and how we you know, sort of reclaim our humanity as we, as we think about all of these things. So um, framing thoughts. I first think that it, it's important to realize where the concept of privacy in Anglo-American law, at least, comes from. And it, it stems from an 1898 Harvard Law Review piece by later Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. And, and I, I, I like to talk about an interesting duality about, uh, about that article and about Brandeis's thinking, um, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, and then, you know, so privacy, is often thought of in different, um, in different ways. Well, actually, why don't I jump into that right now to give context for the second point. So the Brandeis duality is that this article about privacy was actually written not so much about what we think of as privacy today, um, but, but about gossip. It was about um, claims that, that um, you know, pictures were being shown in the media that were invading people's privacy. It was not uh, about how to think about, um, it was not how, about how to think about, how we think about privacy today. It was about media and the way that media presents things in, in, in real time. From there, we got to the idea of a more comprehensive right of privacy, but it was about pictures taken in public initially. And so thinking about that from a duality perspective is, 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 is pretty fascinating. Um, historically, across the globe, in, in Anglo-American law, we focused on privacy as a sectoral matter. When you get to Europe, they've taken it as a much more comprehensive approach. And you'll see a lot of debates in the, in the you know, sort of present time, the way that things flow, um, and fights in the technology industry, especially right now. Um, the, uh, idea of the GDPR, if you've had to click through on your cookies um, to you know, verify your European privacy regulations when you click through to a European website, that's because it's a comprehensive approach. Whereas in American law, especially, there's been a lot more focus on individual types of privacy, health privacy, financial privacy. Um, the, the um, you know, interestingly enough, a, a, a couple of fun factors you know, video rental records privacy, um, that after Robert Bork was, uh, was you know, uh, had his hearings for the Supreme Court um, sort of cast aside, in part, it, it wasn't for this reason, he was, uh, he, his video rental records had, had been uh, sort of sullied through. Someone had gone to the video store to try to get his rent, rental records, and so America passed a law against that, which will, will come up a little bit later as I tell some of the stories. Um, is about, interestingly enough, about Facebook Beacon. Um, but all of these individualized ideas uh, are, are seen as things that need to be protected by laws that get passed in the American legislators, le legislatures. Whereas in Europe, there has always been this comprehensive idea of privacy as a human right. And then we'll talk further about how that these changing expectations about the way that we interact with technology how much technology is around us, the idea that everything um, may be recorded, that it may be searchable, that it may be findable at some point, that begins to really change the way that we think about our world. So let's start with Brandeis and those comprehensive approaches, but also about this idea of the back and forth, the constant watch, the way that all of these surveillance systems um, begin to work, that they uh, offer the presentation of a, you know, a, a panopticon, um, something that's watching you at all times. But then how do you continue to maintain a protective stance? So the idea that everything is being recorded is one of those things that has just you know, become a commonplace. And it, I don't think we've even begun to understand what it will mean. Uh, the searchability, the practicality, the protection of, you know, of information is 
only at its beginning stages. The idea that um, everything might be accessible is in its early days. So noticing that in, in a world where privacy is not necessarily a human right in the US, although it may be, um, you know, it may in, in end up there eventually, um, where in, in Europe it is, the different development of these options is, is something that we will see over time. And coming from Silicon Valley, it's also important to talk about how you discover all of this, how you take those supercomputers in your hand and supercomputers in your pocket and allow for the contacts and connections that, um, that come in this space. And so this is a great comic that outlines how we think about putting these things in context and how we might be able to think about how we get back to you know, the core of a human interrelation. The, the idea that you, you know, just, just stir the pile of data. When, when data is everywhere, do you just stir it to get back to it? You know, what looks right for people over time in, in a world of unbelievable, overwhelming data? How we get to context and understanding is one of the core things that privacy, safety, and security need to stand for. So I want to tell five stories that give some context around the duality that we talked about in Brandeis, the difference between a comprehensive and a sectoral approach, and the appreciation of how we find humanity in a technologically overwhelming and recorded world. And the first of these stories is about Facebook Beacon. Often cited as a, you know, an example of technology run amok uh, in the early days. And it was really actually a much more sophisticated and challenging attempt to think about connection in the first instance. Launched um, in, in the context of an advertising presentation in New York City, um, as we sat there thinking about what the revelation of when, what the action of a um, you know, the pop-up on a third-party website that would move back to a Facebook news feed would, you know, would, would mean to people. It was really just an attempt to think about this interconnection, to get back from the supercomputer in your hand, which at that point you didn't have a supercomputer in your hand. It was, you know, surfing on a website. Um, you, how you would get back to what was then a, a new thing, news feed uh, for Facebook. That, that interconnection was a core part of, and we'll talk about Newsfeed in a minute, was a core part of, of all of the things that, that Mark and the other team saw for the future of the service. But providing protection and providing connection was one of the things that the, 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 the company, unfortunately, didn't do as well as it needed to. Um, we quickly reacted um, in, in you know, in starting this as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as an offering. Um, you know, it, it, was a, it was rolled out in that context of an advertising presentation, quickly seen as an advertising product, but one that wasn't quite adequately protective of people's privacy, safety, and security interests. And so, it was uh, critical for us to, to, to step forth and, and, and build a number of different protections into, into the product at that point. Um, Newsfeed was somewhat of a similar reaction. The buzz at the Facebook office as we thought about what the future of media would look like was intense. There was a lot of optionality uh, explored about how this might work. There was a lot of thought about when people navigated to people's pages, what that would mean and how you would set up a way to allow people to discover it easily. You know, feed-based infrastructures you now see at the core of the products that we talk about and use every day, um, Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn, um, all incredibly important uh, features of, of, our, of our modern era, but this all came from the newsfeed experience at Facebook. Um, 
When it launched, there was a, uh, a single button that you could press to launch it. And it said, awesome. <laughs> it was just an acceptance of the idea that this new world was coming. And that was later seen as a mistake too. Um, one of the key things that's a learning for uh, the company over time, and learning for, for me as well, is how you have to bring people along and have, how you have to think about all of these different you know, options and how change can be a, a difficult challenge. Um, we're also seeing in our intensive world of change and, and expectations, um, what we think about as health data. Now, how many of you have, have Apple Watches? Have you noticed lately how they uh, are, are getting a lot more active in, in watching what you're doing and, uh, and, and letting you know um, what, what, what it thinks you're doing, a, a workout, a walk, things like that? That's part of the change in this world. Now, does that make you comfortable or uncomfortable? Yeah, it doesn't make you uncomfortable? So this change is one that we're going to have to watch very, very carefully and make sure that people are empowered um, to, to make these choices. And in many ways, they make these choices by actually sort of putting on the watch, not putting on the watch, the Fitbit. Um, the question of what happens to the data is, is, is absolutely the key and how it fits under those sectoral protections that we have in the US, but also the comprehensive protections that you have in Europe. One of the things that has driven security conversations over time is the idea that you should know that when a, a breach of, of your personal data, when somebody gets unauthorized access to your personal data, um, I had uh, been able to uh, participate in that the discussion of this early on, and this started in the, uh, in the, in the California legislature, that there was a long work uh, put together by a senator named Joe Simidian, a, a, a set of ideas about bills. And um, he had come to myself and to, um, and to a, a, an expert um, uh, in the field who is much more of a, um, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a privacy advocate. Um, you know, I, I was, I've always been seen as a privacy advocate and someone who works extensively with the community. Um, but Deirdre Mulligan and Joe Simidian and I worked on two things. And Joe Simidian had come to us and had said that there are, you know, there are, are a couple of things that, um, that, he, that he wanted to do to protect people's privacy. And setting this forth in law, seeing some of the European sectoral approach, thinking about what would be critical and what would actually might get through a legislature and begin to set up um, the possibility of, of you know, some change in, in privacy and security. Um, Joe actually suggested two things. He suggested that all websites, and this is the radical idea, he suggested that all websites have to have a privacy policy. Now, this is one of those things where the, the, the quickness with which the world has moved and the expectations and the way that these things are set have changed in all of these years. This was back in 19, uh, this was back in, in what, I guess in 2006, um, when, when, this, when this started. You had a set of possibilities in Joe's, in Joe's presentation for either having this um, first uh, privacy website set up, uh, the, the, the Online Privacy Protection Act, um, or this breach legislation. And breach legislation was the beginning of, of a worldwide movement a worldwide movement around this that, that talked about all sorts of different possibilities um, for how to protect people's, um, people's data. Um, but those challenges are pale in comparison to what we've seen in the last election. All the invasion of uh, of, of, our, of our various pieces of infrastructure um, by, uh, by a variety of foreign actors and by a number of, of you know, domestic actors you know, manipulating uh, all these different parts of the process. 
the speed with which that has happened is, is a core part of what we have to respond to. Um, this has all been put together in a package around Facebook's actions around Cambridge Analytica. And what I want to say first about that is that you've seen a lot of great responsible reaction from Facebook, the company, about understanding that this is a challenge in our age and in how we begin to really see uh, what, might, what misuse might occur in, in our various contexts. The uh, platform at Facebook was part of this original design where you could get easy access. And I mean, how many of you saw the story in the New York Times a couple of days ago about how um, there, there may have been too much access um, from Facebook platform? So the, the, the challenges were legion on thinking about platform and access to data. Um, they, they ended up uh, having you know, extensive access and, and the Cambridge Analytica was able to in fact, build extensive profiles of the way that all of the, the different actors um, you know, operated. Um, and and the, the people, they were able to model people um, and their, you know, and, and to, to, to reach kind of deep into people's souls in a way that was, you know, unhealthy. Unhealthy and, um, you know, that, that needs to be properly, properly fought. So I do want to move along to get to some learnings and some thoughts and a lot of questions. The core of the questions about our future are how we think about protecting humans and their inner relations um, around technology. Now, I don't think that we should be afraid of technology at the end of the day. It can be a great friend, but ultimately what we're trying to build is a, a resonance um, between people and how we communicate and understand each other and operate. Um, this is challenged in our world today by the pace of technology. We should think that it's going to um, accelerate and not decelerate. We should think that it's going to be a uh, incredible uh, factor in the way that we think about our families and our friends and how we connect with each other. You know, we think that it will absolutely um, begin to give us challenges and pauses at all aspects of our lives and, our, and, and how we think about our livelihoods. Um, the idea that everything that we do will be recorded and part of our permanent record is one of the things that, that everyone is going to have to reckon with over time. And it allows for uh, incredible possibilities and incredible accountability and incredible you know, respectful interrelation over time, but it also um, allows for the idea that you maybe can't make out a private space anymore, that you don't feel secure, that you have, you know, uh, there's no situation where you can, can really get away. And that is something that we have to maintain as part of the core of our humanity, the idea of escape and rethinking. We need to be able to find those private spaces. That's part of the core of the Brandeis duality. That's part of the core of the idea that you have a comprehensive set of approaches and protections. And that's part of the idea that ultimately technology should serve people and the people shouldn't necessarily serve the technology. That speed, that pace allows for the start of a conversation. One that I think Facebook the company and a number of other companies are actively engaging in, beginning to get to the bottom of, but working through, you know, in, in, a, in a methodical fashion. You know, the critics of all technology companies come and say that, 
Well, it's, it's just all about the constant acceleration of the world, the constant contact of the world, um, and about making money. Always the core critique. It's just about making money. It is really about interconnecting the world. But it's about interconnecting the world in the right way. It's about thinking about how we maintain our common humanity. It's about making those connections in ways that matter. We have to think about how the change in the media world, again, getting back to the Brandeis duality, changes the way we see the world. That concept in that original Harvard Law Review piece of privacy, of how you have a protective zone, came, interestingly enough, from the idea of a public picture being published. The acceleration of that link between you know, knowledge of, of, a, of a fact in public and understanding of the way that, the, that, that, that people became aware of it. That speed factor is one of the things that our technological era has only accelerated. What's happening now is a bit of a backlash and a bit of a you know, desire to slow these things down, a desire to think about how technology should serve people. And that's one of the things that we have to you know, be core, uh, maintain to our core. But we also have to think about the way that these changes change how we see the world. Now, finally, I, I want to kind of open things up for questions. I want to go deep into some of the issues of the day, especially, where we have you know, the election questions that we've just gotten to the other side of. We have you know, the way that technology can, can serve humanity. Um, but I do want to say that, that the fact of accountability increasing, the fact that we do have these accountable factors operating, is one of the things that, that makes me optimistic about the way that technology serves people. There's a lot of fear out there right now. There's a lot of you know, belief that we just aren't going to necessarily you know, be able to survive in this, in this era. That, the, that the, the robots are going to take our jobs, that the, you know, the, 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 the smartphone will, will, ruin, will ruin our lives and the way that we look at everything, that we're kept from actually enjoying ourselves by uh, technology that gets in our way. I, I think that technology can be made to, to, to serve us. I think that we can actually have um, you know, privacy, safety, and security. And it's important to be able to stand up for it. You know, one of the things that we learned in the early days of Facebook was how important people see privacy. That the, the classic uh, attack on the company was that, you know, well, they think that nobody cares about it. But it built, with you know, some help and guidance, a massive infrastructure that actually allows people to make their own uh, choices about how to share. And that's where we have to start. That's where we have to think about this. This is a question of architecture. This is a question of thoughtful choice. How do we let technology and how do we make technology reflect principled decisions about how people should interrelate. How do we build a more communicative world? And how do we think about how technology should serve us? Now with that, I, I do wanna open it up for a bunch of questions and sort of the issues of the day that are hitting people. Um, because that conversation is actually at the core of this. The speed at which we can sit on our devices, on our phones, texting, messaging back and forth, you know, it, it, it gets you only so far. Ultimately, you know, we all have to deal with each other. We all have to sit and look each other in the eye and have a conversation. You know, ultimately, privacy, safety, and security in this world should be about creating those spaces for people to make that connection. And I, 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 for one, think that while we've served through a challenged period on all of this, that uh, we're headed towards a better one. So I'd love to hear questions about how we get there and how we think about um, operating these things going forward.
So I'm going to take provost privilege and ask the should. first question. <laughs> um, I, I'm struck by the idea of the accountability that mm -hmm. is possible with the surveillance. Mm -hmm. But I'm also equally struck by the manipulation that's available. And so, how, you know, I, probably a lot of people saw on Facebook uh, Keenan's, you know, manipulation of Barack Obama's voice and face and features, and it looked as if he was exactly speaking, right? right. So this, this was the, the election period we just had. So how does this accountability line up with that manipulation, and how do we achieve safety in that? I, I think that that's an excellent question, and we have a, a current issue going on with this right now with, uh, with Jim Acosta and CNN, and the, an issue that's being litigated right. currently in terms of his White House press access, where you know, he was shown in a video, the, the, the claim of the White House was that he, was to, he was, had, had you know, assaulted a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a, a press office person um, and was therefore having his press pass you know, revoked. The, the accountability factor is that it was able to be shown that the, the video was sped up as they tried to show the video that, that, that allegedly showed this you know, sort of pushing or assault. It was altered as it was released by the White House. If the, the accountability factor was able to find that out um, you know, that, that there was a, a, a quick response to say, hey, when this was let out, it was in fact a, already a sped up video, that there is, there is attempt at manipulation. Now, the deep fake that you talked about with Obama um, is something that, that people need to be educated about, that, that they absolutely have to, you know, have a, a, a connection to, um, to, you know, to, to, to know how um, th th that happens, mm -hmm. that you can't necessarily assume, you have to put everything into context. Now, the, the problem with that is that it puts a lot of tax on people, mm -hmm. that the expectation is that they won't be manipulated. Um, one of the cleverer things that's been said about the, the Russian access and, and what's happened um, on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram was that, um, you know, that, that, that in fact, it, it wasn't Facebook that was hacked, it was people. Right. And so the question of how you educate better, how you put better media controls on that allow for this detection, how you deploy machine learning and other, you know, other sort of fantastic technologies to, to sort out these things, and how you look at the, the way that different you know, media platforms handle things that are deep fakes is, is, is all part of the mix. Um, so, we, but we do have to ask ourselves, I mean, are we, are we more worried about technology or, or, or people <laughs> in, in, in those contexts? Well, surely, surely it's the people that are, are deploying it, but I, I, my con biggest concern with all of that is the speed. Right, so it's it is the case that you could break down the video footage, for example, and and say, hey, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't real. They sped it up. It wasn't quite right. But if that happens the day before an election, and casts aspersions on a candidate, and we have to do the deep work to build it back, it's kind of too late. So right. I'm I'm that's where your optimism is a little bit of a concern to me. No, and and fair and fair enough, and and. The, this is by, by no means a exclusively optimistic mm -hmm. you know, view, view of the future. Mm -hmm. The idea that there are challenges is, you know, it, it's endemic every day. It's just part of the way that, that all of the challenges that we face um, sit in our world right now. I mean, the, the politics that we have right now and, and its division is, should be deeply concerning to everyone. The question of how we build that common ground again and how we use technology to do it um, needs to be an open question. Um, but, but we should not assume that technology doesn't have architectures that allow for, for that, that rediscovery of humanity. Well, I don't want to hog the mic. So Next. please. Did you say about news information cynicism? <laughs> And that kind of pollution of the public sphere, the idea of the pollution of the public sphere, 
is one of the key things that, 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 that we need to engage on and that we need to really um, you know, uh, assure that, um, that, that, that we're, we're building these infrastructures that, that, that begin to clean that up. Now, um, the possibility of manipulation and you know, all propaganda being manu manipulation is, has existed you know, time immemorial. Um, the question is, can technology help clean it up? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, again, like I, like I said during the presentation, the, 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 the way that some technology companies have stepped up on this is quite important. Um, I, I, I would say that, that it's still quite a challenge on platforms that have traditionally allowed flow um, of, of just about everything, um, such as Twitter. Although I do think that Twitter is, is stepping up too in, the, in this instance, that, that there, there is a lot more activity that's trying to drive towards you know, helpful messaging, um, towards greater you know, pro-social connectivity. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's again a, a problem of potential people hacking, where the negative you know, becomes, the, the, becomes the obsession, where the, the, the focus on engagement rather than on time well spent, the way that, that uh, you know, quite a number of parts of the movement have stepped up on this, um, is, you know, is, is one of the, the, the challenges that the technology community needs to meet. Thank you for being here, Chris. Uh, I, I'm a, my name is John Roach. I'm a journalism professor here, uh, coincidentally. Uh, this week, we um, spent a lot of time on deep fakes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, to take it to the extreme, as some students did, um, uh, it's very pedestrian. It's not technology that uh, uh, needs a lot of time. Um, one student presented uh, how they could um, have the President of the United States announce that uh, missiles were sent to uh, North Korea uh, and would be landing in 60 seconds. Um, and you think, well, can we verify that? Or does Kim Jong-un respond to it? You know, you're watching uh, a visual. If you're not familiar with deep fakes, it's, I think, something that we should all be familiar with. It's the next uh, flavor of fake news. Um, and uh, you're actually seeing uh, the President of the United States on a screen uh, make that announcement. Um, do you think that uh, the speed that you talked about in which technology is advancing um, is so much more rapid than public awareness. Most people, I would say, wouldn't even know what deep fakes were. Right. Um, and uh, to, to know the implications of that, much less the verification and vetting, uh, it just seems like, a, you know, a, a duality that is really dangerous, in my it, opinion. It, it definitely is dangerous. And there, there definitely are incredible challenges that we face right now. And, and the idea that, that, that speed is the coin of the realm is one of the challenges that, 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 that exists. And, and, and I do think that there's a duty on the part of these platforms to figure out how to filter them out in a meaningful way. There's also a duty on the part of the mainstream media um, to, 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 to filter these things out. And, and there have been quite a, quite a number of discussions lately about when things are presented as facts, which clearly are not facts, sometimes by the president, um, and that they are merely repeated in, um, in, in news reports about them, that that's actually, you know, sort of contributing to the problem of, of, of deep fakes over time. It, it is very important to think about how we um, both have a responsible code of ethics for technology companies, but also for traditional media companies around the presentation of these. So, for instance, the, 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 the presentation of, of the, uh, the, the Obama fake um, without clear labeling on, on a screen to say that this is a fake could in fact be you know, a, a furtherance of that. And so dialogue is the core of how you begin to address that, but that speed factor um, and, and particularly the, the, the deep incentives to manipulate things. You know, one of the things that we did see as we did, it was funny, what, I was in New York before I, before I came up here and uh, I ran into uh, a woman uh, who's now on CBS Morning News, uh, Bianca Goladriga, who was the Facebook reporter for ABC News in the 2008 uh, presidential election, or the 2008, uh, 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 yeah, I guess the presidential election, of course. Um, and uh, Facebook had worked with ABC News at that point around uh, political coverage, and, and Bianca had stepped up 
um, to be their on-air reporter and working with these things. And uh, it, 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 was a, um, it was a fascinating idea of how mainstream media didn't necessarily understand the way that social media was going to change all of these things. The, the possibilities are, are, are endless for thinking about how people get information, and so we have to make those choices quite explicitly and directly. And we need to make sure that our platforms are, are watching over them, mainstream and you know, social. Ultimately, um, it's likely that all media is going to be social in some way or another. That, that we'll, we'll, the supercomputers in our hands talking to the supercomputers in the clouds um, will be the, the main source of the way that we kind of run our days, um, you know, talk, talk to people, and, and hopefully just put them down sometimes too, and really, and really connect. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing for you know, a technology person coming to give speeches is that you know, a lot of the times what we need is less technology. Um, we, need, we need that, you know, we need technology to serve humanity instead of you know, the other way around. Mr. Kelly, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have you here, but I, I, I want to challenge uh, one point on the surprise of how much people value their privacy. Mm -hmm. um, because in the late 90s, we went through all of the, the surge of the health websites, Healthy on, C. Everett Coop, all of those folks that we thought we were going to get our medical records online. And they found out quickly that people weren't comfortable with that. Um, and and it, to, 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 to go further with that question is the initial response from Facebook and Twitter and, and generally the industry and social media was the idea that, hey, we just build the platforms. We're not responsible for, for managing. And then the second part of my question is, is not the algorithms in terms of how the news feeds work contributing to the polarization and the isolation of thought? In other words, if I'm clicking on things, I'm being fed more of the same food. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, contributing more and more to the polarization because I'm hearing people reinforce what I already think. Mm -hmm. So let me take the second part first. There's definitely a risk of, of echo chambers. Um, and, and as it's, you know, it, it was originally, uh, the term originally coined for this was the filter bubble. Um, uh, Eli Pariser wrote a book called The Filter Bubble about how you know, echo chambers develop and, and people only watch more of what, uh, of what they, they already, uh, they, they watch things that reinforce what they already believe. And I think that it's important for us as human beings to realize that, that often that, that's true. Um, that, that people in a limited, you know, with limited amounts of time and limited amounts of attention, you know, all media businesses are about the brokerage of human attention. Uh, the, the, the question is where it gets directed and how, and then how do our you know, nervous systems react to what we see and, 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 what we, and what we want to see, the more things that we want to see. The fact of the matter is, though, that um, ultimately that's always been the case, that there's always been filter bubbles. Um, you know, and so then the question becomes, I think, you know, so as in my discussions with Eli and a number of others, I always say, well, the, well, the New York Times is a filter bubble too, in some ways. It, I mean, people who choose to watch the New York Times versus Fox News versus, you know, all of these different choices reflect people's different, you know, experiences and understandings and what they, what they want to see. It's important for us to talk openly about how important it is to reach out to different points of view um, and, to, and to build technology, ideally, that, that helps people um, reach out around different points of view. And, and I do think that Facebook, the company, has taken some you know, critiques of the, the idea that it's just all sort of reactive and it, and it you know, sort of gets to the, to the amygdala um, and, and the, the, the reactivity um, and, and that that needs to be tempered 
some point. And you've seen this in some of the time well spent movement, some of the, the, the conversations and critiques about how we rethink um, how we use technology. You know, these are real challenges, and, and I do think that the industry is trying to, trying to meet them and trying to, to, to address them. Um, now, the, the first question was about health records and health information. Now, this is a problem that's not solved, um, and it's not going to be solved anytime soon. I talk about the health monitors you know, for a reason, because we're just beginning to get used to the idea that it's not only your health records, it's not only the things that used to sit on paper that now sit in electronic medical records that um, you know, might be used against you by insurance companies without your knowledge. The, all of the challenges that, that, that exist um, are, are, are very real ones. But there are new ones that, that are poised by the, the collection of information on Apple Watches and everything else, that, that, that there's the, the possibility of misuse in any collection of data. And some people in the privacy community have always thought that, that the limitation of collection is how you deal with this. Um, I've, I've always posited that, that the fact of technology and, and its presence and the ubiquitousness of surveillance and all these different things means that the, the march of technology means that, that you're not really going to be able to say you can't ever collect data on, on these topics or that, that, that limitation principles are actually going to be limited. And the fact of the matter is that, that a lot of the data can be incredibly useful to, to you as a person. And it's meant to be. Um, it's absolutely meant to be at, at, at the end of the day. So the, the question is how you put rules around it and how you enforce them with technology. And, and I think that, that more and more companies are trying to address that. You know, you have to make sure that the laws are in place, that some laws are in place. You have to make sure, and, and I think ideally, and personally I, I believe in a, that there should be a baseline you know, privacy legislation in the U.S. And, and more and more companies are coming around to that point of view, which is a good thing. Um, but the, the, how you address this is, is, the, is, is, is the challenge. You know, standing up and saying, stop, you know, stop the world, I want to get off, is not, is, is not a real option. So uh, what, what I'd say is that special vigilance is necessary um, in a variety of these things. And that's what's been reflected traditionally in American law with the sectoral protections of healthcare under HIPAA of, of um, you know, video rental records, <laughs> of, of, of things like that, that that don't necessarily make sense, but or they don't make sense as separate categories. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can agree that health and financial and, and a number of these other ones are, 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 are important, even in, in agreeing that, that there has to be a baseline on, on, on all of this. Yeah. Well, continuing on that, uh, Where are you here. now? There you right. go. Okay. Continuing on that, on that question, uh, what do you think of employers using your Facebook page to deny you employment? So there are a number of laws that, that protect against that in, in the right context. And, 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 you know, well, if, how would you know? If they're using it How would you know that that's exactly the reason that you don't get hired? And Actually, discovering that is one of the things that, that, that accountability can begin to, to, to drive over time. You, you're in, and, and this is a good example of how the time scale of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of everything changes. Um, the, the possibility of how, the question of how you do enforcement of existing employment law actually can be enhanced by technology as well that you can, you can have employer surveys and, and if, for, for regulators and, and other options to think about um, to, to see improper use or... And or what if your employment. Facebook page is private? Can they and, ask for your... And, and, that, and, and in fact, this is something that we, that we litigated while, while I was at the company. And, and the answer to that, generally speaking, is no. Um, the, the request for a password, that the, there, there was a fascinating case that came up where, um, you know, that in a public... Uh, in a public sector context, mm -hmm. a, uh, a, a, a public agency asked for an employee's, a potential employee's Facebook password. And we went to, you know, we, we got ready to go to court over it um, to say that that's, it's a violation of our terms of service, it's an invasion of their privacy, it's a, you know, th there are existing, you know, rules against this. And importantly, you know, we also went to, went to their union 
um, and explained that they, that they might want to have a conversation too. And, and that began to make a big difference in, in, you know, in fighting back against that. Hi, I have a question regarding net neutrality. Uh -huh. and how does this figure into the future composition of accountability and the dualities that you mentioned? Well, historically, net neutrality is a great and important protection of the principle that you should have you know, technology development and innovation flourish. You have to have the idea that, that those who control the pipes shouldn't allow the, the selection of technology and they shouldn't allow, importantly, um, the slowdown of, of flows for those who aren't favored. You know, with more and more media companies having direct control over um, internet pipes, it, 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 it's, it's critically important, um, certainly from the technology industry's perspective, but from, you know, from a, a, a social experience perspective, that, um, that people get to choose, that there's a democratizing effect of the internet, that, that you actually you know, get to put uh, on, your, uh, on your phone, on your page, and, and get quick access to um, the content that you're trying to seek. Um, so it, it plays a major role in, in assuring that, uh, that there's real protection um, for, for consumers. Now, um, obviously there's been huge fights over this, most of which have been lost, and it, it is a real loss for, um, for, you know, for the, the, the country, in my view, um, that net neutrality was attacked and, and somewhat repealed. Now, the fact that the internet still allows people to make all of these incredible choices and, and, and quickly means that, that over time, I, I, I think that we'll be able to, to get past this. Um, but but it, it, it's, a, it's certainly a, a I, I, I still believe deeply in net neutrality and think that, uh, that, that, that we should go back to the regime that we had before. Do you believe that the generation being born now will be oblivious to the issue of privacy of personal data? And to their credit, these younger, legislators coming in now, will they be more apt to making um, companies more accountable because of their knowledge, of, more knowledge of technology? So uh, I, I think that there was a theory that, that, um, that privacy didn't matter, um, that it's been tested over and over again. Um, I think that, you know, certainly Facebook saw a backlash from the assertion that privacy doesn't matter when, when, when it was attributed uh, to, to my, you know, to, to, in my belief, somewhat wrongly to the company. Um, it, it was, you know, we, we did believe in privacy. It was just a different conception of privacy than, than you know, certain you know, different people had uh, about what it, what it meant. You know, often privacy means a, uh, some people think that privacy means that nobody can ever see anything uh, uh, about me anywhere. And I was used to, I like to point out the, the part of this and I should probably have started with this. Um, I want all of you to know that none of you can tell anyone that I was here. <laughs> um, that, that there are some people who have that conception of privacy and, and the way that it's, that it's presented. Um, you know, we have to figure out how the, the presentation, the creation of media around the, the fact that someone was in a place at a time, that they did a certain thing. Uh, what, what rules are there around that? Um, and when I was at Facebook, we were dedicated to building technology around that. And the company still is both dedicated to building that technology, and I think that you've seen a resurgence um, in the idea of how much, you know, how, how serious that devotion is. Um, and the way that it, it needs to, you know, sort of be a, a central organizing principle of what the next generation of the internet looks like. We have one over here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm representing the uh, younger generation here tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So 
So I realized how you were talking about the misuses of different social medias uh, across the platform for many different people. Uh, but what about the younger generation? How do you think that's affecting children uh, with misuses of technology and social media? So my kids are eight and 10. And we limit, we limit screen time, but we allow it because it's important. Um, there's no presence on social media for kids that young. One of the key sectoral rules um, is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which says that under 13, you have to have verifiable parental consent um, to collect information about kids online. Um, this, I, I believe, is a good law and, and something that, that, that really sort of sets a, a reasonable bar for when the conversation needs to happen about presence on social media. And um, you know, I do think over time that, that there are ways to do what they have verified, what they call verifiable parental consent um, you know, un under that law. So how old, how old are you? Uh, 11. 11, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and are you on social media? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other important things to know is how, how attractive and how interesting this is over time. And so, you know, we allow our kids screen time and um, that, 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 that the, the thought of how you interrelate in an online environment is something that, that, that will be critical in the future. The idea of cultural you know, uh, knowledge um, among what kids are talking about is, is a core part of, of, you know, sort of relating to each other. Um, in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the kid environment. So you don't want to say, no, all screen time is bad. Um, I, I, I don't think that makes sense. But limited screen time, um, talking about purpose um, for technology and how, it, and how you connect um, is, is, is one of the things that should be a watchword going forward. Um, all, all these things need to be done thoughtfully. They all need to be planned. We need to know more about the challenges that, that our networks present to us. Um, we need to think about the concepts of privacy, safety, and security and how to bake them in to systems. Um, but we also need to think about you know, where we're gonna be able to sort of stop a march forward and where we're going to need to be able to adapt to it. So now, you know, I, I do think that, that kids you know, have to be ready for, uh, for the real world. Um, I'll add, you know, one more, one more story from, um, you know, from, from the Facebook days that when I joined every, that was, we'd, we'd been in American colleges only. We'd had .edu verified email addresses um, in those different things, but we were expanding into high schools and it was actually one of the reasons that, that, I, was, that I was hired was because I had worked on this for another big internet portal called Excite at Home. And um, you know the, 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 the challenges of younger people coming online and safety infrastructure um, that, that needed to be around that and accountability that needed to be around that um, was part of what Facebook wanted to represent. And you know, we, we ended up um, you know, working extensively with law enforcement um, across the, the country to think about those, those safety issues and to, and to build in ideas about how to you know, to, to, to protect and make choices and drive accountability um, in the social media, uh, in the social media space. And, you know, one of the things that I would always say is that, look, this won't be perfect. You know, people do bad things to, to each other and especially teenagers do bad things to each other in, in the real world. So bad things are going to happen on platform and the, the, there will be bullying, there will be attacks. The question is how you drive accountability around it. The question is how you make sure that it gets tied to you know, a, a person's name. And the real name culture on Facebook, you know, so I think continues to be very protective to this day. Um, the proliferation of fakes um, that, that, that you know, reared its ugly head around the election was one of the major problems. And, uh, and I, I know for a fact that the company has gotten incredibly vigilant about fake accounts and fake names and, 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 and everything like that in, in that instance. But in, in the, you know, in the uh, you know, teenage area and with, and with kids getting online, accountability is a critical factor for learning. 
Well, I know that there are a million more questions, but we really have to wrap it up. He's been up here for a long time now, folks. So I hope that we follow his advice and let these questions lead us to real conversations. But I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you, coming. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. And, and please, please do, you know, please do have those conversations. Um, have them with your kids, have them with your parents, have them with each other. Um, you know, technology needs to be a, 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 a friend and a, and a facilitator of real human connection. So thank you again. Thank you.